Right, so welcome to this Tuesday talk on knot theory. And I hand you over to Scott, who's going to say what he's going to talk about. He's not going to tell us what he's going to talk about. <laughs> he's going to mime it. He's going to mime it. Okay, we have to lip read this one. <laughs> Press the button, Scott. Turn on your microphone, Scott. <laughs> He's muttering to himself. No, we can't hear you. How about, how about now? Is it better? Better, a little louder. It's yeah. better than it was. Okay. It was silent before. That's fine. Yeah. I think. Okay. okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, and we're going to bring this. This is what I'm going to talk about. We're going to talk about immersed and embedded braidings. Oh. And it's just um, slightly past noon over here. Oh, let's see. I need to change the view. Um, and uh, it, <clears throat> it's uh, in honor of Sir Richard Starkey. He played drums with a popular band from Liverpool, and it's his 80th, his 80th birthday today. Oh, uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, it's noon over here. So you're uh, for Richard Starkey. You're supposed to say uh, peace and love at noon every July 7th at 12 p.m. So peace and love. Real name's uh, Ringo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm glad you figured out who that was. Very good, Colin. Some of the young people may not know of, know of him. <laughs> okay, so um, uh, the obligatory uh, support slide, um, and let's carry on. So uh, a braided manifold is going to be an embedding or an immersion of a manifold in co-dimension two, and so it will be in the product of two disks or sorry, two intervals with an end sphere. So that the projection onto the end sphere is a simple branched covering of the end sphere. So you project onto the end sphere and the branch set should be a given knot length or embedded surface. And I'll tell you what I mean by simple, but basically the branch points all should be of degree two. And so when n is equal to, this is called a surface braid and the branch set is a collection of an even number of points, which indeed, uh, because the surface is orientable, the points can be signed and paired. Okay, so the goal of the talk is to demonstrate uh, a number of examples of how to construct these braidings. And here's the outline. We're gonna recall principles for categorical, and we'll recall uh, the Joel Street uh, version of uh, categorical approach to knots and tangles, and then I'll introduce some glyphography. I'll talk a little bit about exchanges. Um, we'll talk about braids, uh, charts, equivalent charts, braided manifolds. We'll make some remarks of hard splittings, and then I'll show you some uh, braidings of four manifolds. Uh, and uh, so the goal is to demonstrate by a number of examples how to construct these braids. Uh, as a disclaimer right now, I don't know how to construct the threefold branch cover of S4 branched along the two twist spun trefoil. I know in principle how to do it, but the explicit uh, description is eluding me. Um, it will almost certainly be immersed, but we'll have some other uh, examples. <clears throat> okay, so let's review these principles uh, very quickly. Uh, different things are not equal. Arrows are a means of comparing things that are not equal. Doing followed by undoing may or may not be the same thing as not doing. And uh, that has to do with what we mean by, if it is the same as not doing, then that's a type of strict invertibility. If it's not the same, then we measure the difference and call that a weak invertibility. <clears throat> so
simultaneity is elusive, and exchange followed by change is comparable to change followed by exchange. Uh, this last bit is how we get the Rademeister type 3 mode. A small category consists of a set of objects. Between any two objects, there's a set of morphisms. And if you have two arrows, um, say G from B and F from A to B, so that the target of F is equal to the source of G, then the composition has source A and target C. And uh, we want the composition of arrows to be associative. We actually want that to be strictly associative. And for object, uh, there's an identity arrow that behaves as an identity. So the composition of the identity on B with F is equal to F. And that's also the uh, identity, uh, the co composition of F with the identity on A. Um, I suppose some people weaken these axioms. I would hesitate to do so, at least at the, cat at the level of the category. But um, I'm not so brave as you can see because I'm only talking about small categories. Uh, an N category is one for which the collection of arrows forms an N one category. The problem with N categories is how to get the top level uh, arrows so this set over here is a category, but the set of arrows, say, from B to C is also a category. You've got to get those uh, two categories playing together nicely. <clears throat> In order for me to get them to play together nicely, I'm going to assume that there's a danger. Um, so uh, in this axiom, uh, F, capital F and G could be of any dimension. And we'll have a natural family of exchangers, which are two isomorphisms. And they're designed to relate the composition on the left to the composition on, on the right. And uh, on the left-hand side here, we have exchange followed by change is the same thing as change followed by exchange. Uh, on the left, first we exchange F and G and then change F to H. On the right, we change F to H and then exchange the positions of G and H. Um, the, there's a, quite a lot in here. Uh, natural family, naturality means that change followed by exchange is exchange followed by change. They have to be isomorphisms. They, I should have an isomorphisms here. Uh, and that means that there's an exchanger that goes back the other direction. And, um, when you compose in either direction, then that means that doing followed by undoing is the same as not doing. And in the case that the change is an exchange, then here's a change, here's an exchange, and here's an exchange, and then there's a change. So that's why it uh, winds up giving you the right of Meister type three move. Okay. Um, Normal people say that diagrams commute, uh, but why be normal? Let's assume that in, if they don't commute because they may be different, then let's assume that there's an arrow, double arrow, that relates the source to the target. And there may be another double arrow that goes in the opposite direction. <clears throat> the important thing is that there is a well-defined source and target object. There's Defined source and target single arrow, and the, the double arrow goes between them. They, uh, these arrows are composed globularly, and the globular composition focuses upon the categorical structure in the HOM set. So uh, that's why we can do that. And there's an alternative description, and when I get to this slide, I'm supposed to tell you a little bit more about what I mean by arrows. So if you think about objects as being a pair of points, then an arrow is an interval, a directed interval between the pair of points. If you have a pair of arrows as on the right hand side here, then an arrow between those should be a directed square. If I had a pair of these directed 
constructed squares and I could stack one on top of the other. And then a three arrow would be a directed cube. And then with, with that three arrow in mind, you have to make sure that everything is nice along the boundary suitable identity. Uh, the thing I'm not going to allow is horizontal composition of arrows because simultaneity is illusory. And Colin, you said you couldn't read the fonts. Can, are they legible now? Very clear. Okay. Okay. So here we resolve this by augmenting F by the identity on its source, augmenting G by the identity on its target. And that's, and we replace that uh, horizontal composition with this staggered composition skew composition, and then we assume that there's an arrow of one higher dimension which exchanges those things. Um, we also can uh, contract all the arrows in the source and then contract all but two of the arrows in the target to get an upward pointing arrow. Uh, we can do the same to get a downward pointing arrow where sources and targets are interchanged. And um, now, in order to see how the other are playing together, you two of these triangles and glue them accor according to the oriented edges. Uh, you never would have a triangle in which all the edges are going in the same direction because there wouldn't be a well-defined source and target. Uh, and so as you glue those together, you figure out where there's a, a positive boundary and a, neg a negative boundary and a positive boundary. And in those cases, uh, <coughs> You will allow, you'll allow yourself skew compositions like this. And other than the obvious delta nabla composition or gluing along the, uh, the, these other arrows, which also is a globular composition, these are the only things that you can do with arrows of that type. OK, so um, I was mentioning this earlier. Uh, the Isle of Thorns conference was 1987. Um, there, Tarayev described the category of tangles, and one of Joel or Street sent me an email probably 15 years ago and said that two weeks later they gave the freeness result. And the freeness result was that the free braided monoidal category on one self dual object generator is the category of tangles. Um, why this category is a Three braided monoidal category is that it's secretly a three category. And um, from my point of view, it's easier to think about it as, the, as a three category rather than uh, compounding a lot of adjectives here. For example, if you insert type one moves, then you would have ribbon or pivotal or tortile, and keeping those axioms straight is a bit beyond my. Uh, capability of vocabulary. So um, <clears throat> I'm not going to work with a self dual object generator. I'm going to work with a two arrow and it's dual. So uh, in order to make that a double arrow, we're going to take an unnamed object, an identity arrow between them, and then define generating two arrows, which are down, up, and nothing. So we have those three types of double arrows. And then um, we're going to allow ourselves to remove or insert identity patches as needed. However, um, when I write this double arrow on the left and I want to exchange it, it would exchange to the double arrow on the right, far right, but either one of them is going to be depicted by this vertical stack. And I lied. I'm going to turn vertical stacks into horizontal stacks. And so the exchangers are expressed as indicated here. There are eight types depending on positive, negative, who's on, on the left and who's on the right. And um, we also have creation and annihilation operators, cups and caps. Uh, and this, this gives uh, a physical met metaphor that Lou's been talking about. We have these creation operators, which create a particle and antiparticle pair. Then we have interactions between the particles caused by exchangers, 
we'll only have interactions between two particles. That's an aspect of the illusory nature of simultaneity. Ooh, I said that right. And then um, we have annihilation operators. So the red and blue dots are double arrows, and um, our crossings, cups, and caps are triple arrows. Okay. Uh, the way we compose triple arrows is as indicated. Um, and uh, when we compose them, then we get, uh, for example, in this case, we get knot diagrams. Now, um, there's a bit of detail that I'm leaving out. And so I want you to, uh, if you can see me uh, on the screen, I have uh, in my notebook, I have a pen, which is a kind of bookmark. And the bookmark tells me how many pages are in front and in back of the I don't think we, we can see it, Scott. Oh, um, I think well, you'll have to stop. Um, no, no, no. Just imagine it. Just imagine that you have a bookmark. And the bookmark actually tells you how many pages are in front and behind you. So pages serve as identities. And then whatever is interesting is occurring on the page you're reading, of course. And so um, this cap here would have a bookmark of zero, zero. Um, and this cap also has a bookmark of zero, zero. But if we're going to compose them, then that cap has to occur along these identities here. So there's an auxiliary piece of information that I'm not drawing, which is you can always, with these glyphs, you can always tell where the glyph is located with respect to other identities. The axioms for the uh, braided monoidal or the three category involved are that exchange followed by return is no transaction. That gives you the type two moves. Exchange followed by exchange is exchange followed by change. That gives you the type three move. And um, it also gives you some other type two moves where in this case, change is the annihilation. And then if you exchange change nothing with that, you get nothing. Um, that would be a, um, uh, a song by a keyboard player who went to play with that group. Nothing for nothing leaves nothing. And then um, that's the same thing as exchange followed by change. Now we're going to come back to these interactions in a little bit, uh, but not explicitly. Uh, and we can go ahead and assert type one moves. Now, in the categorical version of tangles, um, the, as I said, they're adjectives, pivotal, ribbon, um, tortile. Uh, they all have to do with how you're going to deal with type one moves, whether you're going to allow, allow them or whether you're going to allow positive and negative type one moves and so forth. Uh, we also need zigzags, and explicitly, I haven't said anything about exchanging the height of different crossings, but that also occurs because there's an exchanger axiom at one level up. Okay, we had those as axioms, but we wanna replace equality by higher order arrows. So um, we could replace the type one move by this broken surface diagram. This is just analog of the knot diagram, a surface sitting in free space with some indication of height with respect to four space. That broken surface diagram, I, we have to put things in general position. And then you see there would be a double curve if we allowed that to be immersed. So we'll in, denote the double curve by this red curve. We'll denote the fold, this green curve, apologies to the colorblind. Uh, and then we have a chart, and in this chart, I say that the double curve has I sheets in front of it and J sheets behind it, and the fold has I sheets in front of it and J sheets behind it. Rather than calling them D and F, we can put serifs on the glyphs. The serifs will tell us that it's either a crossing or a fold. Uh, the short arc here is meant to suggest the cap or cup, or as the case may be. So there are these eight types of type one moves. 
Uh, the arrow on the double curve is a bit of a fiction. You have to be careful what you mean by that arrow. Uh, I suppose what I mean is that the rise of the uh, type of the crossing is negative, then the arrow should be pointing downward. Yeah. Okay. Um, for the type two move, we'll replace uh, the type two move by a broken surface diagram that describes it. Then we'll uh, abstract the broken surface diagram into a chart. And then from that chart, we'll abstract glyphs out of that. Um, and here again, the uh, arrows are a bit of a fiction. They're, only, they're not a fiction if both sheets are oriented towards, towards you. But if the sheets are, one is oriented one way and one is oriented the other way, you still have oriented arcs here, but the orientation is a bit uh, confusing with respect to the signs of the crossings here. Um, <clears throat> we can also replace the type three move uh, by a glyph as indicated here. Uh, there would be eight such glyphs. I've only shown you the up version, they'll be the down version. Um, and I don't think I need to zoom in on this, uh, but let's focus in on what's going on here. You see, as part of the glyph, I've tried to indicate some front and backness with the thickness of the lines. I've also tried to in indicate the sign of the crossing by means of the serifs of the glyph. So the glyph is going to have a vertex. It's going to have some edges coming out of the vertex, and then it's going to have some label labelings on the edges, which are serifs that are trying to help indicate source and target. Okay. Um, in the case of surfaces, uh, we can replace that naturality condition with the condition that Lou stated, uh, but we if we're trying to get generating sets, we need um, both over and under in information. We can actually eliminate the upside down versions with these, with a little clever trick I'm not going to go into. Uh, the other thing is that these moves follow from the naturality condition of the crossing, um, but I'm not going to go into that here. It's a nice diagrammatic uh, exercise. And then we can develop glyphs like this. Now I know these glyphs on the surface, all these eight glyphs all look the same, but they have some slight differences. And the glyphs together with telling you what the source and target uh, arrows are, are enough to tell you what's going on. Okay, um, I want to make a digression on exchanges. And I want you to imagine that you have two sticks a red stick on the table in front of you on the left and a blue stick on the right. And obviously you want red to indicate right. So reach over with your right hand, pick up the red stick. So you pick up the capital of Louisiana and then you move the blue stick over with your left hand and then drop the red stick down. Um, that's a process of exchange and this is the exchanger axiom. So let me show you the process. This is just a rehash of the exchanger axiom from before. So um, it can be drawn in this fashion where these tubes indicate where F and G might be. And then the chair is the identity sheet. The red stick and blue stick configuration in space time, because you did lift that thing up, the stick up off the table, looks like this diagram over here. And I'd like to say that the exchanger of an identity is the identity of an exchanger. And that's logically true, but you have to reparameterize these surfaces. One of the nice things about this quadruple arrow that is an exchanger is that it actually gives you the right of Meister type three move and it also gives you the psi move in this sense. Um, another type nice thing about that exchanger four arrow is that it gives you the quadruple point move, which is one of the Roseman moves. So here we have change followed by exchange. It's the same thing as exchange followed by change. 
it gives you another one of the Roseman moves, uh, the move in which a uh, branch point moves through a uh, transverse sheet, or as most people like to call it, the funny move. Okay, um, grades. Can you still hear me, by the way? Yes, you're fine. Okay, uh, this microphone is funky. All right, so uh, we have the braid generators, positive and negative generators. The stand-in for the bookmark will just be the index I because we're gonna fix a braid index so we'll know how many pages are left in the book. We have the presentation for the braid group. One, two, one is two, one, two, and one, three is three, one. And uh, here, all the arrows are pointing downward, so we use black dots for those. And uh, the braid relations together with the trivial relations induce these following relations. But different things aren't equal, and so for each one of those equalities, we have to represent it by some arrow. So these are the relations, and the arrows that we'll include are, so we have um, six versions of the Reitermeister type three move. Those are indicated by these six glyphs. The, this would be left-hand side goes to right-hand side. And so if you wanna go right-hand side to left-hand side, you just reverse the arrows here. Um, the trivial relations are going to be uh, sigma i, sigma i inverse, um, and those are depicted by glyphs here. And again, this is left-hand side going to right-hand side. The opposite relation is just reverse of that. And then there are four commutator relations, but I've written all eight of them. So here I've written all the left-hand side or the right-hand side. Um, let's focus in on that a bit. Um, I is less than J, so J is closer to us, and so um, uh, J is going to be a thicker, thicker line here, okay? Uh, and hopefully, yeah, okay. We also want to create some new quadruple arrows. Each one of the braid relations was a quadruple arrow because it had to do with moving a bit of three space to another bit of three space. And uh, we're going to create some other quadruple arrows and we're going to call these black vertices. They're related to type one moves and saddles. The black vertex is a stand in for this diagram here. So this is a broken surface diagram. Um, if you still have some um, uh, uh, acetone transparencies sitting in your filing cabinet, take two of them, cut them both uh, halfway down the, the middle and then scotch tape and glue the, um, this, the bottom of the one in back to the top of the one in front, and then you'll get a, a, a diagram like this. Um, and now I want to talk about charts. This is an idea due to Kamada. So a chart of degree or braid index n is a finite graph. Uh, the labels on the edges, the edges are oriented. The labels go from one through n minus one. We have vertices of degree one, four, or six, and the edges adjacent to a degree one vertex is either oriented towards or away from the vertex. So these are our one vertices. These are black. The four edges adjacent to a degree four vertex are labeled I and J alternately. I and J are far enough apart. Diagonally opposite edges are oriented coherently. Those are called crosses. And then the six edges adjacent to a group degree six vertex are labeled with I and I plus or minus one with three ingoing and three outgoing edges. And so those are our white vertices. So uh, those are the vertices for charts and uh, the graph should be disjoint from the boundary of the disk. And I've already told you what a black, white, and a crossing are. 
Okay, so those are how we're going to build charts. Uh, <clears throat> we use charts to construct surface braids. Uh, and this is uh, an example that I want you to make to, to make sure that you understand. So um, this should be uh, this chart on the left is a stand in for this broken surface diagram. The broken surface diagram um, coincides with the graph of z goes to z squared on the Riemann sphere. You have a simple branch point, a degree two branch point at the origin. You also have a degree two branch point at infinity. And uh, I'm very likely to call this diagram a purse. So it's going to be called the green purse. Um, and uh, note that if I project outward, then this is going to induce the branch covering of the sphere with two simple branch points. Okay? All right. This is a braid movie, and uh, the braid movie coincides with this chart, and we're going to walk slowly through that. Uh, namely, this is the chart here. These are the first two stills in the movie. The chart has degree three because it has edges labeled one and two, and so there are three strings that are involved, and to move from the first still in the movie to the next still in the movie involves a type two, Reitermeister type two move, which we indicated by that red arc. Uh, to move from the second to the third, we get another Reitermeister type two move. To get from the third to the fourth, we have a third type two move. Observe that the arcs here are oriented, and so our rightward pointing arc indicates a positive crossing, and the leftward pointing arc indicates a negative crossing. The next thing that happens is we encounter this singular braid where there's these two arcs are coming together and then they split to give us a genuine crossing. Then we see another singular braid. This vertex should be down here somewhere. That's this crossing here. And then it resolves to become a genuine crossing. Um, it then becomes singular and resolves. This one will become singular and resolve. And then we perform some type two moves. So everything in this picture is decomposed of pieces that are like this. So our branch points are like this. I might not have the sign right. Uh, and our double curves look like this. You'll have to turn this picture on its side to get that correct but, uh, or turn it either counterclockwise or anti-clockwise or clockwise. Oh my goodness, what happened? My screen's just blacked out. Oh, we got, we've got a blue screen. <laughs> oh, okay, I, I see. It's quite pretty. I'm sorry, uh, yeah, I seem to have knocked the, um, HDMI cable. Um, it's going to take a moment. I hope that I didn't, the computer didn't crash. Um, we can still uh, hear you. <laughs> I, all right, so the computer didn't crash. I see what, where we are now. Okay, so um, can you see the sharing? Yeah, we can well, see it's the frozen. sharing. Okay. Um, frozen with I'm, a blue screen, with a blue, blue panel. All right, we'll, we'll, we'll come back in. Sorry about that. Uh, let's see. Um, well, Let's see, um, what's the wisest thing to do here? Uh, probably quit something, quit something. And um, try one more time. Nope. Um,
Let me, I'm going to uh, open it up with a different bit of software, um, which should resolve the problem. Um, but I have to remember where I was. Ah, there we go. Okay. So I think this is where we were, yes? Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Um, uh, all right, so this was the chart, and this is another chart with a corresponding movie. The next movie is um, uh, decomposed with things like this. I don't have a, a drawing of a crossing in here, uh, but I do have one subsequently. So um, let's carry on, that's the corresponding chart. Okay. Um, in each still, I drew that as a braid diagram, you form the closure, and then at the top and the bottom, you cap everything off. So in this uh, spaceship-like configuration, you have these nested disks on the inside, and then you have the surface braid that's existing inside the rectangular disk inside there, and whatever the chart is indicating when you put the corresponding surface in there. Okay, so um, we need to know when two charts are equivalent, and the axioms are that the exchanger is strongly invertible, and the exchangers are also natural with respect to other morphisms. Um, as a consequence, we get psi moves, and I, as an, and I mentioned earlier that the tetrahedral move was a consequence of the naturality of the exchanger axis. Um, is in addition, we have these moves where we can pull a branch point through a white vertex. Uh, now you can't see it because I know the fonts are too small, but there are orientation uh, restrictions on the on the red curves here. You can't just willy-nilly pull a, a black vertex through. It'll get hung up uh, with the right of Meister moves unless certain things are consistent, unless the other two strings, other four strings, are consistently oriented. Uh, Kamada calls these two families of moves C3 moves. We also have that the type 3 move and the type 2 move are strongly invertible, and in particular, there is a zigzag relation to the type 2 move, and um, white vertices and black vertices can be pushed off of optima as indicated here. Um, this is an adjoint property, or it's related to a unit element, and I would not like to say that because uh, I haven't watched Emily's uh, video on the unit element yet, but uh, she just posted something uh, yesterday that looks quite good. Um, okay, so that's how isotopies of surface braids are described by means of those uh, various moves. <coughs> There's a theorem of Kamada, which is a version of the Alexander theorem. Orientable surfaces in force space can be put into braided form. He also has a Markov theorem. So there's a notion of conjugation and a notion of stabilization. Um, so we've described isotopies of surface braids, um, but suppose we add some other five arrows and think that we can um, compose those five arrows with the isomorphism so far. And in, we do that, then we can create Braided three manifolds. Okay, so um, I'll remind you a braided manifold is an embedding of a manifold in co-dimension two into the product of a disk and a sphere. So that the projection onto the sphere is a simple branch covering of the sphere. Simple means that all the branch points have degree two, and that and we also want the branch point to either be a knot or a link or a surface. In, uh, in four space. And uh, when n equal two, that means it's a surface braid uh, with an even number of branch points. And the goal is to demonstrate examples of these braidings. And I've done a bit of that. Uh, we have this um, surface braid, which is a two-fold branch cover of a two-sphere with two simple branch points. 
Um, we, I'd like to look at the transition from nothing to something. And so the surface braid, if this square has braid index two, then this surface braid, the closure of that, corresponds to these two nested spheres. Each sphere bounds a ball. You take this sphere in the inside, it bounds a ball inside, and then the subsequently the outside sphere bounds a ball. Or going in the other time direction, you create a ball bounded by the sphere, then you create another ball bounded by the inside sphere. And then to get from this picture on the left to the picture on the right. By the way, is my mouse moving? Yes, now. Okay, okay, so, yeah, yeah, I don't, so um, then we can get to here by the mean, by means of attaching a one handle. The one handle has this twist in it because the spheres are both oriented in the same direction. So you have to twist the one handle so the orientations are matching. Cap off the spheres with a pair of three-dimensional balls and the result is a braided three ball, okay? All right, I'll take that as a yes. And so this is introduced as a new five arrow. I'm going to want um, immersion, so I'm going to introduce a solepsis where a braid generator changes to its opposite. Solepsis can be pushed off of black vertices or they can be created or annihilated in pairs. So you have a um, uh, source or a sink pair of solepsis being created here. And uh, we said we were going to create, include five arrows like this. We'll also create a way of splitting an arc into two black vertices like this. So these are our five arrows. <clears throat> In addition, the solepsis can move through crossings, through optima, and through um, uh, white vertices again with orientation uh, considerations as as indicated here. Okay, breathe. Okay, um, a ch chart movie is going to be consistent, consisting of a sequence of charts. So we had a braid movie, which is a sequence of braids. The, each braid movie is represented by a chart. A chart movie then is a sequence of charts. The first and last chart are going to be empty, and one of the charts is obtained by another by means of any one of the isomorphisms or any of the other five arrows that we've described. Um, so a chart is a quadruple arrow, a chart movie is a five arrow, and uh, we're always talking about the ambient dimension here. So um, dots exist in dimension two, exchanges and caps exist in, in dimension three, Rademeister moves exist in dimension four, and then uh, changes between Rosemann moves exist in dimension five. At the beginning and the end of the movie, the labels on the charts haven't, don't have to be the same, but the beginning and the end should either be the creation of a circle or the creation of an arc or the annihilation thereof. So I could create a circle with label I, but then when I annihilate, I might annihilate a circle with label J. Now we interpolate between the stills and the chart to create curtain-like structures. Um, so these are three examples of curtain-like structures that we'll see here. This is when we move this branch point through a transverse sheet. It's related to the Roseman funny move. And uh, here's a chart movie. So it's a sequence of charts. Uh, there's a corresponding curtain. Can somebody tell me what the curtain is? It's a disc, okay. Not quite quick on your feet yet. All right, so the corresponding curtain is a disc. And so the two-fold branch cover of the three-sphere branched over an knotted circle is also a three-sphere. The curtain describes a braiding in five space thereof. And this braiding is analogous to the central picture here. The, the entire braiding of that is this time evolution. A pair of three balls are born, 
a handle is attached between them and then a two handle annihilates them and then the pair of three balls dies. Uh, and remember that uh, the, in the chart, we always form these closures. Uh, <clears throat> if we take this chart moving, then it's going to be a pair of discs for the curtain and the corresponding movie of surfaces looks like this. The corresponding three manifold is going to be uh, the two-fold branch cover branched along a pair of unlinked circles. So that's going to be S2 cross S1. Uh, you create a sphere, a three sphere, and then you uh, attach a handle between it, between the two. And so this describes a braiding of S2 cross S1 sitting inside S3 so that the um, branching is these two circles. The branch set is these two circles. Now, um, many of us learned um, about two-fold branch covers from Dale. And we learned that we would take two copies of the three-sphere, cut along a cipher, cut along each along the cipher surface, glue the positive half of one to the negative half of the other. And a cipher surface is a special case of a curtain. And um, what else? So we've, I want to put the ciphered surface into general position. These horizontal line segments indicate where I'm going to cut the ciphered surface. And then the, the chart indicates how I cut the ciphered surface. The braid index is two. So all the labels on all these arcs is one. Is one. They're not included. And um, that we get a lens space is because this is a two bridged knot. And we'll actually see some of the lens space structure pretty easily. Because if you look at the initial point of the movie or the end point of the movie, you see that this describes a solid torus. This chart here describes a two-fold branch cover of S2 with four branch points. So that's a torus. It's on the cover of George Francis's book. Uh, there's a one handle that attaches here to get you there. Uh, then there's another one handle that attaches here. And then there are two uh, three balls that are capped off. So there's a solid torus here. There's a solid torus there. And then in the intermediate stage, you get a homeomorphism of the torus. And um, it's difficult to see from this that it actually gives the 5-2 homeomorphism, but it does. And you just have to trace longitudes and latitudes carefully through the movie. On the other hand, if you use a uh, non-orientable surface, then we'll be able to see that easily in the case of the trefoil. Um, uh, Robert Fall Harbor has a lovely sculpture of a Three half trace Mobius band where the boundary is a uh, 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 a trefoil, um, and I should have inserted that, but I didn't find it in time. So um, let's look through this here. This is the movie that's involved. <coughs> At this end, we have an immersed solid torus. We had to immerse so that we keep the boundary oriented. And so we create these selepses. And then um, over in this region, we look here. And then this dot starts moving down and exchange places with this dot, then straightens out. So this is a half twist. And then this is another half twist. And this is a third half twist. So there you're seeing the 3-1 structure, if you think about uh, any one of these cross sections is being a torus, then you're seeing the um, homeomorphism of the torus occurring at that level. And um, that's what I wanted to say about the Hagar splitting is that if you put all your optima above or below in the knot diagram, then you not only see the Hagar splitting, but you see a very explicit description of the um, homeomorphism of the surface in involved. This is a fourfold branch cover of the three sphere branched over the hop flank. Uh, it's braided in five space. The 
curtain consists of these two intersecting discs. The uh, movie describes those two intersecting discs. And I went overboard here and I described for you each of the Bray, each still in the Bray movie that corresponds to the chart. So we have the two intersecting discs, we have the movie, and then we have the Bray movie. Okay, uh, so there's an explicit description of a three manifold described in five space that you, you can carry around in your pocket. Uh, everything is controlled by this bra these bridge points of that form. Okay. The trefoil is three colorable, so we can use that three coloring to uh, label one arc with one, the other arc with two, and we can create a curtain that describes the threefold branch covering of the three sphere branched along the trefoil. And uh, this is the chart movie. These are the important pieces of the chart. Um, we have three concentric three spheres with two one handles attached between them. And that would be, when we kept those off, that would be a three ball. And then we have, uh, what's going on here is we create one crossing, two crossings, and then there's the third crossing there. And then in this region here, we push this black vertex um, through to uh, get the, th through these other two arcs, they're oriented coherently, so we create a white vertex. Then we push this black vertex, which is red, through again, and then um, keeping all the endpoints fixed, we um, then simplify that uh, using pieces of surface here. So this is, this is the rest of the curtain. Uh, so that describes a lot of the curtain structure. There is a point where there's a saddle point that's occurring here, but that's actually one of the isotopies for surface braids. This one goes to 11, so why stop here? Let's make a curtain movie. So this is a sequence of curtains where uh, the beginning and end are empty curtains and uh, each of the first one and the last one is uh, either a two sphere with a label or it's a disc or a sphere. The labels don't have to agree. And the middle ones uh, differ by some six isomorphisms. Let's see how we're doing. Okay, uh, I only have a couple minutes more. So, um, This is a curtain movie. Each still is a curtain. The uh, stills represent uh, S3, disjoint union S3. After we attach a one handle between them, we get an S3. In the middle, we have an S1 cross S2. We've already said that. We have an S3 and we have an S3. So this curtain looks like it's describing an S2 cross S2 braided in four space with a torus as the branch set. Uh, and so let me just review this. Each still in a curtain movie represents a chart movie. Each still in a chart movie represents a mo braid movie. Each still in a braid movie represents a sequence of wor words in the braid generator. Successive stills differ by equivalence of braid words or the insertion or deletion of a braid generator or solepsis. A braid movie is a composition of quadruple arrows. A chart movie is a composition of quintuple arrows. And a curtain movie is the composition of six arrows, hextuple arrows. And so um, that curtain movie is describing an, an embedding or an immersion of a four manifold in six space. Here's one. This is a curtain movie. We have the birth of a disc, then we'll split the disc into two. Then we'll start twisting one of these discs around until it's turned completely over. Then we'll put in a, a pair of solepses over here and move them off and then reconnect. And so the surface that's described by the red, by the boundary curves is a Klein bottle. 
And so we've described an immersed braiding of CP2 connect some um, CP2 bar inside force space by means of this uh, braid movie, uh, by me means of this curtain movie. And I suppose that there's a corresponding solid that we could construct, but that's beyond my abilities. Um, this is a curtain movie that describes a braiding of the spun trefoil. The spun trefoil is also three colorable. So it's a three-fold branch cover of S4 branched along the spun trefoil. The movie is palindromic, so we go from one to six to 14 and then back again. And um, uh, those of you knew, who know, knew Peter Hilton will remember that he wrote this wonderful palindrome. Dog note, I dissent, a fast never prevents a fatness, I diet on cod. Uh, you can find that on Wikipedia, that's where I got it. And uh, so this is a palindromic movie and if I'm not mistaken, each still in the movie is also palindromic. And so um, I think that's quite nice that you get these explicit descriptions of embeddings and immersions as braidings. Um, the question of whether these things are knotted or not, I can't answer. Um, I'm not sure what I know what it means for a lens space to be knotted in five space. I do know that the fundamental groups of the lens spaces that I've shown you are all trivial. Uh, ah, right, so I wanted to just finish up with how that curtain movie works. So I forgot that I had done this. So we start intertwining these discs and then uh, we can focus in the uh, crucial area here. And then there are, um, uh, uh, branch points passing through and then certain isotopy moves to the curtains. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Scott. Um, are there um, any questions? So everyone understood everything. Uh, okay, good. I'm uh, glad. What, I it, what is a <laughs> celebsis? A cele ah, that's funny. As I was rehearsing the talks, I said, I bet I, Dale's going to ask about this. It's actually, if you look at the um, x squared plus y squared is less than or equal to 1, and then you look at z squared plus w squared less than or equal to 1, and those two discs intersect at the origin in four space. And so the solipsis is just a model of that. It's just where you have these two surfaces and they pass through each other at a single point. So, um, yeah. Uh, the English, I forgot what the English word means, but uh, people in category theory call this pass through a solipsis. Oh. Scott, another question. Yeah. Can you do a Briscorn variety of type ABC? That's a three manifold embedded in five space and it's a branch covering along the along a knot of type BC by A fold cyclic. Ah, good question, Lou. Yeah, um, we're doing we this tells us how to do simple branch covers. And in principle, we know how to do non-simple branch cover. So when you have z goes to z, z to the end along the along along the knot. So yes, we can do that in principle. Um, we have not written this down, um, but yeah, yeah. So I should be able to, for example. Um, you may have already done some example of it, right? Like, yeah, I probably did it with a trap on me. Um, yeah. It, um, like take a two-fold branch covering uh, along the trefoil knot and put it into five space in a natural way. Yeah, well, you use the cipher circuit. Mm -hmm. And then you use that. But for the, um, if you have a higher order branching, then there, in principle, we can do this. We just have to um, 
quantify the funny moves where we take the uh, the black the black vertices no longer are have valence one they have valence n and we have to push those through now um, what we can do instead is we can immerse them with these highly singular points in four space and then we can try to lift those to five space with some some uh, possible double points. What's it going to look like to try to get a generalization to braided manifolds in co-dimension two in general? Um, I don't know. Um, you, it would be nice to have Alexander and Markov type theorems, but CET's uh, Markov theorem is quite limited. Um, uh, I at least want to get up to seven and nine. So. Yeah, of course. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to do the grease corn manifold. Um, right. Uh, yeah. I, I feel like that's a question for Brian. Is he still here? No, I'm no. not sure if he ever came, actually. He was here. He was, was here. He? Oh, okay. Yeah, um, uh, but yeah, uh, I'm sort of, I'm tapped out when I start to try to think about uh, sequences of curtains and assembling them into solids. The solids aren't manifolds because they have these branching things. And so we have to, I mean, in general, um, uh, CW complexes are too, too strong. But what's occurring along this uh, co-dimension one set uh, is, and co-dimension two and co-dimension three sets is, re requires a lot of control and subtlety. I think it can be done, but I don't. I haven't done it. Yeah, there was another small remark that I was going to say is that when I think about these arrows in terms of cubes, and that's sort of a cube cubification of the category and it's different than what one does with trunks. So that cubu cubulation, that cubicle type category is quite a bit different than what a trunk is. Okay, so um, are there no more questions? So we've reached the end. Well, well thanks again, Scott. Thank you very much for letting me talk today. Um, Thank you, Scott. Yeah. Um, and then the next talk is on Friday. And I think, Colin, are you talking on Friday? Yes, that's what you wanted. Um, yes, yeah, what we some, want. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to do some real physics, not, real not quantum physics. <laughs> OK. Or try and do something. So physics in the large. Very, very large, I think. Y yes. Okay. I'm going to tell you, tell you how to correct the standard model of the universe so there's no dark matter and, uh, and uh, ARP, ARPs, quasars exist. So I'll tell you about that. Great. Well, we can't wait. <laughs> that was good. Uh, Lou, I'll send you the slides from my uh, personal email address. Sure, sure. Because they're so large. they will... When, when I get the slides, they will reappear in our Dropbox. Okay. Okay, so um, if, if there's anything you want to say when I stop recording, I'm stopping recording now.